Okay, so now let's go and talk about um, looking at a function where we just have a binomial, um, you know, where we could expand the binomial expansion to understand a little bit more, but kind of seeing how um, a binomial raised to a power can, you know, actually be beneficial to us when identifying certain characteristics of a polynomial. So what we have here is we all have polynomials, but they're just written as a binomial raised to a power. And obviously what we have learned is we could immediately go ahead and expand that. And some people look at these and that's the first thing they want to do. And if you're dealing with like a quadratic or a cubic, you know, that's not the end of the world. Um, but then obviously the higher and higher powers we get, the the less sense that really makes. And then also for the operations that we're going to do in this video, it's really going to be best to leave everything as a binomial raised to a power. So um, a couple things that are different about this video is, you know, I'm representing things as an equation. I have them set up equal to zero or I have them, you know, used as a function notation. So I kind of mix up the notation a little bit and I'll kind of discuss that in each video uh, or each problem, you know, really how that affects anything. It doesn't affect anything, but, you know, what we can do to look at it. So the first thing we want to look at is finding the X and oh well actually actually let's go up here and just talk about a couple things just to kind of remember the X and Y intercepts is when the graph crosses the X or Y axis and just notice that the you know um, the X intercept is when Y equals zero the Y intercept is when X equals zero. So that's something that we discussed before, but I really want to you know make sure we understand that because for any function that's going to be the case. Um, and then also we talk about a little notation with zeros. You know, the zeros is when f of x is equal to true, um, and the real zero is going to be the x-intercept. So when we're talking about finding the zeros, we're really just looking for finding the x-intercepts. And the x-intercept, again, is when y is equal to zero. All right, so let's kind of get through this first example. We have y equals x plus 1 squared. So that's going to be a quadratic, right? Because we know if we were to expand that, that would be a quadratic binomial, or trinomial, sorry. If we want to identify... Um, Let's actually break this up into different components. So this would be really like part A, this will be part B, part C, part D, and part E. Okay, so I'll kind of label these. And here's kind of like the parent function here, where N represents the power. And then we have H is going to be, you know, X minus H or plus whatever may be the case. All right, so in this first example, if we want to find the... Um, for example, we want to find the y-intercepts. Then the first thing we know is that the y-intercept is when x is equal to 0. So we're basically looking for what is the y-value when x is equal to 0. That's, that's my question mark. <laughs> so that's basically what we're asking ourselves. So all we need to do for this first example is just replace x with 0 and then solve for y. Okay, well, there's not much work here we need to do. You know, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, so y is equal to 1. So we could write the uh, y-intercept as y equals 1, or we could just write this as a coordinate point where x is 0 and the y-coordinate is 1, okay? For b, and this is where it comes really helpful to having a binomial uh, squared, is finding the real zeros, which is really just finding the x-intercepts. So for the x-intercepts, we're going to be x is equal to or y is going to be equal to 0, and we're basically looking for the values of x that makes that true. Or another way of representing that is when the function is set equal to 0, what is the values of x that makes that true? Okay, so now what we're going to do is replace y, in this case, with 0. Even though I know the definition said f of x, but again, remember y and f of x are really interchangeable. They're both the output of a function. So in this case, we're just using y in the notation, but I could have used f of x. So in this case, we're just going to use 0 is equal to, you know, x plus 1 squared. Now, what's nice about this is rather than, like, expanding this and trying to, you know, even if I was going to factor this, you know, I could go immediately go to the zero product property if I wanted to. But in this case, all I'm simply going to do is just use the square root method and just take the square root of both sides. Now, 0 is not positive or negative, so I don't need to worry about the plus or minus in this case. So therefore, it's just going to be 0 is equal to x plus 1, subtract 1, subtract 1, x is equal to negative 1 is the x-intercept, or we could represent that as a coordinate point with negative 1, comma 0. Now, it's a couple things that are important, and I don't think I added, so I'm going to add the graphs to this. Um, I didn't do this for the video, so we can kind of verify. Um, but you know, so we have our two x-intercepts, and but one thing I want to talk about, like, is the multiplicity. Remember, the multiplicity 
is when we have some when we have a zero in factored form the power of that factor is going to be the multiplicity so you can see here that n and when with the definition of multiplicity we used m for that case so this case you can see the multiplicity is two so what that means is in part c which is like the zeros so i don't really we don't really write the zeros as a coordinate point. You could, but the zeros is x equal negative 1. So when we're talking about the multiplicity, we could say x equals negative 1 with a multiplicity. I'm just going to say multiplicity is equal to 2. Okay, so what that means is that's a repeated zero. And if we, if we looked at the graph, which I'll provide the... Um, on the worksheet, I'll provide the link to it. You'll see that this graph is going to bounce at negative 1. Um, the next thing is the transformations. So if we just look at this, we notice that in the binomial squared, or at least in the parent graph, this h is inside of the function. So therefore, that's going to be a shift left or right. So in this case, um, since we're doing x plus 1, remember that's shifting one unit to the left. So shift left 1. So shifting left one unit. And then last but not least is the end behavior. Now, again, we can look at this, and if we were to expand this out, you would see that this would give you x squared, which is a even degree, and it would have 1 as a leading coefficient, which would be positive. So we could just say, um, you could say this is going to rise left and rise right. In a more traditional uh, mathematical sense, we could say, you know, let's zoom in a little bit more. As x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity, and as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches infinity. Again, this is our way of saying rise left, rise right. So as x approaches infinity, that means as it's going to the right, the graph is rising. As the graph is going to the left, the graph is also rising. That's supposed to be an arrow. x is approaching infinity. Okay, so. That basically covers everything for that one, I believe. Yes, very much. Awesome. So let's go and work. Uh, let's go and look at the next one. So in the next example, uh, let's use something I haven't used. I don't use much before. Let's use brown. Mm, you love your brown. Okay. So now I'm using f of x. And again, guys, if it makes you feel comfortable and you want to use y, cool. Go ahead and use y. I mean, they're interchangeable in this. We are talking about a polynomial function, so really both representation, you know, could be fine. Um, I bring that up just because when we're talking about x and y intercepts, you know, the notation I used in the notes was y equals 0, x equals 0. So that's why it might be helpful just to kind of use x and y's for that case. Um, so for to find the y intercept, we're just going to set x equal to 0. So therefore, that's basically going to look like, um, now again, I can, I'll just use y. y is equal to 0 minus 2 cubed. Okay, 0 minus 2 is just negative 2. Negative cubed, negative 2 cubed is going to be a negative 8. So y equals negative 8. I'm not going to write this as a coordinate point like I did before. Um, obviously, you can do that if you like, and it really kind of depends on the question that you need. But y equals negative 8 is the y-intercept. If we're looking for the zeros, a lot of times when we're talking about zeros, we're talking about the function, right? So basically, what we're looking at is when f of x equals 0. And that's why I wanted to kind of provide different notation for that, because the definition says when f of x equals 0, which is really the same thing as saying when y is equal to 0. But anyways, let's just set y equal to 0, or f of x equal to 0, and then solve for x. x minus 2 cubed. And now, we're going to use the cube root property, basically taking the cube root of both sides. And the nice thing about having this binomial, right, you know, you could use a zero product property, um, which this, and, and again, what we'll see, and actually I should mention that. I'll, I'll maybe take a look at this uh, next time. So anyways, we're, we're going to get, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. so we're going to get zero. Oh, let's go back to brown. So let me, I'll bring up that point here and after I finish this. So we're going to have zero equals x minus 2, I don't really need parentheses. So x minus 2, add 2 to the other side, you can see x is equal to 2. That is going to be my 0. Now the point that I wanted to bring up with this is if you didn't want to use the cube root property, you want to use the zero product property, fine. Use the zero product property, but let's you do this in like red or something. If you use a zero product property, a couple things I want you to note on this. This is x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 2. 
Okay. So basically if you're using zero product variable, you're going to get X equals two, but it's repeated three times, right? So you're going to get the one zero, but it's going to be repeated three times. And one thing we talked about polynomial functions is that the possible number of zeros is always going to equal the degree of the polynomial. And if we were to expand this for M behavior, you can see that this is going to be a degree three. But there's only going to be one real zero at x equals two. The thing is that zero is repeated three, which we call the multiplicity. So that's again where like the multiplicity comes into play. So C in this case, or the multiplicity I'm just going to write is my zero x equals two with a multiplicity equal to three because the zero has been repeated three times. In the similar case over here, Instead of using the square root of both sides, I could use a zero product property again. I could say x plus 1 times x plus 1. And what you'd see is if you were to use a zero product property, you'd get x equals negative 1, but it's repeated twice. And again, that rep repetition is what we call the multiplicity. So the, you know, you can think about it that way, but I think the easier way of just to like, I quickly identify the multiplicity is obviously looking at the power and you can find the multiplicity. Um, as far as identifying the transformations here, Dang it. So uh, as far as the trans identifying the transformations, now we're uh, subtracting a two inside the function. Now this is a cubic, but again, look at the parent function. It doesn't matter what the power is, right? This is, I mean, h is going to be your transformation. And if we're subtracting, if we're doing x minus h, h is our transformation. So d in this case is going to be shift right two. Okay, and then E, since this, if we were to expand this out, then you would have a X cubed, right? The highest degree, highest power would be X cubed, dot, 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 whatever the, you know, expansion is for um, a binomial to the cubed power. We don't need to do it. We just know that the highest degree is going to be three. The leading coefficient here would be a positive one. So therefore, the graph is going to fall left and rise right. We'll do that in mathematical notation. So I'll write that as you know, as x approaches infinity, that means as the graph is going to the right, so as we move to the right, the graph is going to rise. So f of x approaches infinity. And then as x approaches negative infinity, so as we're moving to the left, the graph is falling. So f of x is approaching negative infinity. Remember, x is representing the x values, f of x is representing the output values, or like the y values, the up and downs. This is the left and right, this is the up and downs. Um, for the next two examples, I'll just do the rise, rise and falling to make things kind of go a little bit quicker, or at least for the, uh, yeah, the next two examples. Okay, so now on this one, I set it equal to zero. So that means we, uh, it's still a function, um, you know, still represents, you know, this is an equation actually, but we can still represent a function, but it just doesn't have a function name. So that means we could call it f of x, g of x, h of x, whatever we really want to call it. So when we have something written as an equation, if we're going to use, you know, function notation, we just need to really define, you know, what that is going to be as our function notation. So um, in this case, we just already have something as zero, but if we wanted to find the y-intercepts or the zeros or everything we're doing, the same, op same process applies. It's just not defined as a function for us um, in this case. So again, we're still going to want to go through our steps here. So let's go ahead and find A. If, if I want to find the y-intercept, well, then I want to find out what is y is equal to when x is zero. So right now, it's not written as a, an equation with an x and a y variable. So I'm just going to replace the zero with a y and then solve by putting a z or solve for y when x is equal to zero. Okay, two times zero is zero plus one, one to the fourth power, so y is equal to one. Okay, now to find the zeros, it's already written in to find the zeros, right? We already have like our function equal to zero. So to find the zeros, I'm just going to solve for, solve for x. Now again, you could expand this out, but you start to see that, all right, the higher that power is, the more work I really have to start doing, right? Um, so I don't really want to expand this and use zero product property, but we do see from this case that we're going to have one zero, one real zero, um, and it's going to be repeated four times because again, remember the total number of zeros, which we'll explain more later, is going to be the number of degrees. But we're only going to get one of them. But the re the way we can make up for having a maximum number of four zeros is you can see that it has been repeated four times. Um, so now we can use the fourth root property. So take the fourth root. 
on both sides. The nice thing about taking the root of zero is you're always just going to have zero, so we don't really need to worry in that case. So zero equals 2x plus 1. Use a little inverse operation, subtract 1, divide by 2. x is equal to a negative 1 half. If I want to find the multiplicity, I again just look at the power and see that's what my repetition is of my 1, 0. So therefore, I'll just write the 0, x equals negative 1 half with a multiplicity equal to 4. And my vertical shift, now remember, don't want to say it's being shifted left 1 because we have a b. b stinks, right? b messes all that up. So the best way to do this is set whatever is inside your function equal to 0. And we know that equals x equals negative 1 half. So what this really means is my graph is being shifted 1 half units to the left. It's not being shifted. Um, it's not being shifted, you know, negative one unit. And the, and the easy way, the other way to kind of look at this is just to factor out the two. If you factor out the two, what you get is x plus one half. Okay, so now you can see that, oh, it is a shift one half units to the, to the left, right? So we just say shift one half to the left. And then to find the end behavior, we notice that if I was to expand this, my highest power would be x to the fourth. Um, and then my leading coefficient, you know, whatever it is, doesn't matter. It's, you know, going to be um, 2x, yeah, it would be 2 times 2 to the fourth, so 8, 16. So it would be 16, but it doesn't matter. It's, it, we don't care what the number is. We just want to know is it positive or it's going to be negative, and it's going to be positive. So therefore, this is going to be a rise right, rise left. Rise right and rise left. All right, last example. Now, in this example, you can see that the x is second, right? It's not listed first. So what I want to do is I'm going to want to rewrite this in a better notation. So let's go ahead and use purple. So if I was to rewrite this, I'd rewrite it like negative x plus 2. Why am I writing plus 2? Because the 2 is positive. Okay. Now, you could even go one step further and say, I don't like having that negative right there. I want to, I want to make sure I factor out my b. So let's go one step even further y equals negative x minus 2 to the fifth. Okay, There's nothing wrong with this notation for doing the math that we're going to do, but once we get down to um, once we get down to identifying the uh, end behavior as well as the transformation, I like this notation. Okay, um, But let's go ahead and figure out you know, the uh, y-intercept first. So to identify the y-intercept, we're just going to replace x with 0. So we'd have y equals 2 minus 0 to the fifth. 2 minus 0 is 2. 2 raised to the fifth power is going to be 32, right? I'm just going to make sure for 16. Yeah, 32. Okay, we could write that as a coordinate point or leave it there. To find the 0, um, we're going to set the y value equal to 0 so, and then solve for x. So 0 equals 2 minus x to the fifth. Use our lovely uh, fifth root property on both sides. Again, the fifth root and raising to the fifth power are inverse operations, so they're going to undo each other. So that's why it's going to leave us just with our um, quantity 2 minus x. And we'll have 0 equals 2 minus x. Now I can just add the x to the other side. You could subtract the 2 and then divide by negative 1, but either way you see that x is equal to 2. Uh, when identifying the multiplicity, you can see that this is being basically repeated five times, so that means it's a repeated multiplicity. Uh, oh, one thing just to remember, when it's odd multiplicity, again, for this one and this one, remember it's going to cross, and the even multiplicity, remember it bounces. But this one, you're going to have a zero, only one real zero, right? There's only one real zero here. So if you were to look at the graph, which again, I'll, I'll provide those graphs for each of these. When you look at these graphs, what you're going to notice is this graph only crosses at x equals 2. And since it has an odd multiplicity of 5, it's going to cross, right? And however, there's going to be an opportunity for four more zeros, which we'll learn in, you know, later of how those come up. But you can see this multiplicity that makes sure that adds up to 5, which is important. Um, all right. And last one, or let's look at the vertical transformations. Ha, ha, ha. So the vertical transformations, you can do the exact same thing what we did here. Take inside of our function and set it equal to 0. So negative x 
plus two, or at least to see where the transformations are. This isn't going to, um, this is just going to tell you the shifting left or right. So again, I'm going to have, you know, X plus two when I solve that. And again, if you look at this transformation, you can see that, yes, the graph is being shifted two units to the right. It's also being reflected about the Y axis. So we got to make sure we include both of those. So we're going to say shift to shift. I'm just going to say right two units. Sorry. Shift right two units and reflect the y-axis okay and then getting to the last point here is identifying the expansion now if we are to obviously expand this out we can't get take this negative outside of this radical so you know we can look at it this way if we're gonna be multiplying this any odd number of times we see that the highest power the, the degree here is gonna be 5 and if we're multiplying that odd number of times it's gonna be a negative so that means my leading coefficient is going to be negative and my degree is going to be um, odd. So therefore, based on our end behavior that we know, this graph is going to rise left and fall right. And all the information that I'm providing to you for you guys or as you're working on, I, you know, I'll, I'll provide a link here up here on my original notes. So therefore, you can go back and uh, check your solutions to make sure you see that how the end behavior works. Make sure that the x intercepts and the y intercepts, you know, are confirmed. Um, so therefore, if there was a little mistake that I made or you made, you can kind of visually see how that happens. So that's when we're dealing with a binomial, you know, raised to a power. Now I'm just going to mix it up a little bit more and add um, some problems here where we have the binomial squared, but then we add some numbers in there and that's going to change that a little bit. So let's go ahead and get on to example number five.